You totally. didn't just use a lady's room. You didn't use a restroom. You weren't resting in there. You weren't powdering your face in the powder room. Yeah, you were pinching loaf. <laughs> and that is something that people don't like to talk about. And for good reason. Dear Shandy. Welcome back to Dear Shandy, listeners. Hello, Andy. Howdy. Howdy. We're in our living room, mm-hmm. which means... Q. And... A. Yes, we continue to get great questions from you guys. Do you want to start nice and light? There's a really big one in here that's very serious that I feel like I need to work my way up to. Want to do that in the middle? Yeah. Okay. This question is from Jennifer. Dear Shandy, love your podcast. Actually, she wrote, hey, Shandy. I'm okay with that. (laughs) As long as you use the proper name of Shandy. Okay. My friend and I were discussing how to keep chemistry going long term. I was in an 11-year marriage where I eventually felt like the man's mother. And she's now in an open relationship because every time she moves in with someone, the spark seems to fade rather quickly and intimacy goes right out the window. I'm currently in a relationship with spark to spare, but we are discussing moving in and I'm scared. What are your best tips? Stuff like don't go number two in front of each other, keep shaving your legs, etc. <laughs> Uh, how do we keep the spark alive it's interesting it's an interesting point she brings up because i've i've had like zero tolerance farting relationships yeah and i've had ones where it's like you know okay we're gonna have a few here and there (laughs) a few here and there yeah okay but i i think it's sort of it's a it's it's a chicken or egg because i think if you're Having open pooping and farting in your relationship, it could be a sign that you guys are really comfortable with each other and and things are good. Or it could be a sign that you've misread the situation and that (laughs) one person is revolted by you and and you just keep persisting and that's just not going to work out. I feel like answering that part of the question doesn't really answer the question itself, but I cannot even like imagine being in a relationship where I did number two anywhere close to you yeah you don't number two as far as you know that doesn't it's not something i do and and just to give a little uh to give a little detail about our relationship might not be necessary but i initially in our relationship what said are you about to reveal <laughs> I, I, I early in our relationship i said that only flowers come out of your butt yes and so from now on from then on this and currently so anytime that Either of us has to do a number two. We say we have to make a flower. <laughs> we also, I also refer to uh, your your farts as air flowers. Why do you say my farts? You also fart. You also air flower. Yes, I, I don't deny this. I think that every relationship has its own uh, vocabulary mm-hmm. in a way. Like you have your own pet names for each other and your own just... Yeah. Terminology, if you will. And for us, I I never had this with, by the way, other relationships. Just with you specifically, it started out as a joke that I couldn't possibly make a number two. I could only flowers would come out of me. And now we just that's the thing. It's an actual thing. No irony that we say. And I'm okay with it because it's it's become so ingrained in our lexicon or our vocabulary that I now actually think that maybe flowers do come out of you. (laughs) subconsciously so i guess our Do way flowers come out of you or is, is yes that... oh okay i just want to make sure what else would come out of me well that's what i thought moving on so to less important things so i guess the real question is does the fact that we sort of dance around the bodily functions side of our bodies with each other do you think that serves our the fact that we've maintained chemistry after all these years I personally think, unless you're, some people are extremely comfortable with bodily functions. Yeah. Most people I know openly fart in front of, I don't know about like any uh, number twos, but. I know of both open, like real, I know of both extremes on on like all just talking about poop and farting all the time. And then I know ones where it's like taboo. Even if there was an actual audible fart and they were just sitting in the same room, it would be ignored. No. Oh, absolutely. How could you not mention it? Oh, it's it's because they're that. Let's be honest. It's usually just funny. Oh, oh yeah, it's funny. But some people, it's, it's funny if it doesn't happen too often. 
Yeah, if it happens often, or if it's not the right type, like a good funny fart, like a like a little trumpet or like a squeak is hilarious. But if it's like a, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. like there's kinds that are just not funny. I guess this is our way of saying that we fall right in the middle of that spectrum. All in the middle. And I believe that part of being a human is in some ways denying that you're an animal. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of what we do. Dressing in beautiful clothes, makeup, like perfume, like just yeah. not talking about like going, oh, I have to use the ladies yeah, room. Yeah, the restroom. The restroom. And then there's yeah. a door. Yeah, there's a door and you come back as if nothing happened. Like, I know what you did in there. <laughs> I know what happened. Yeah, totally. You didn't just use a ladies room. You didn't use a restroom. You weren't resting in there. You weren't powdering your face in the powder room. Yeah, you were pinching loaf. <laughs> And that is something that people don't like to talk about. And for good reason, because we are in this whole fantasy world of, you know, we're above animals. We're like super beings. Yes. And we're not. And we're sex is, a, is something you do for pleasure and not yes. simply to procreate. Exactly. But sex is the one area where we allow ourselves like this is going to be animal stuff. And that's why I think a lot of people are super uncomfortable with sex. But sex is maybe the most animalistic thing humans do yes but we love it so much that we just sort of let it go like no one loves watching or being near someone taking a deuce <laughs> if they did i think there'd be a lot more of it going on and, and people would you know uh, i do think there's probably a whole subsection oh, there is I've, i know of actually people who are into that it's like a fetish i know people who are into number one but number two is really i know one hardcore. couple and i'm not going to mention who they are but can you imagine if you did? <laughs> if I what? If you did mention who they are. Could you imagine? I think that's a lawsuit. Yeah. That I mean, is a that's lawsuit. how serious it is, though. That tells you something. Totally. Like, if I said, oh, my friend likes to watch his girlfriend pee, and I mentioned his name, it wouldn't be cool, and they'd be pissed. But if I said his, his girlfriend likes to watch him take a dump, I think we'd have a possible legal issue. Yeah, Dear Shandy would no longer be in business after that. Yeah, be, <laughs> that would be the end of Dear Shandy. Embroiled <laughs> yeah. in court cases. So <laughs> we keep going off topic and talking about yeah. about poop. But I actually think that the way to keep chemistry and sex and the spark alive doesn't have a ton to do with that, to be honest. No. It's sort of, this is a tough question to answer because it's so case by case. It is very bespoke and it applies you to- You read the room. Yes. And you also have to be with someone who allows you to be into what you're into. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. F for example, I think that porn is underutilized in the bedroom in relationships because I think a lot of people get jealous about it. Mm. But really, it's the ultimate tool if both of you are okay with being into what you're into. I'll give you the ultimate tool. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Um, so for me, my first tip is use porn. Yeah. How do we go from using porn to fart from farting to using porn? Oh, well, because I'm trying to actually answer her question no, instead I of know, just talking about how you shouldn't poop or fart in front of each other. Yeah. Because that's, I don't think, I think that time is what lessens the spark as the sense of wonder and mystery leaves the relationship. Yeah. Like, you know, we know that we do the things we do. Like you said, we know that we're animals deep down. I don't think that if I saw you make a flower that it would make me not want to have sex with you in the future. Does that but make sense? But it may make you not want to have sex with me that day. <laughs> hmm. There, there needs to be some mystery. And I do believe that if you both really enjoy farting, then embrace it. But I would say just be a little careful about getting too comfortable with bodily functions and kind of more animalistic things that the body does all the time. Yeah, I just think that's a very superficial reason like i think that that applies and i think it's sort of a factor but i think it there's an it you have to do all the things one is maintain just a bit of like a physical mystery there like the, you don't need to have the door open while you do number two i i i 100 agree i think that even if your partner kind of embraces it a little bit and like a like they find it funny or it's never a good idea but even if they find it funny they may eventually unbeknownst to them, lose some degree of attraction or feeling of mystery about you. It, it, mystery is very important. And there's nothing mysterious about just letting her, letting her rip. 
<laughs> and there is nothing. It's the least mysterious thing I've ever seen. I mean, we're answering this based on our own preferences. So I've, I've I, done a lot of, I've inquired about this yeah, with many couples. But I know a lot of women who are in relationships where they just openly fart around each other and they usually they'll laugh like if, if oh, it's a really yeah. big fart then the partner will laugh i was also in a relationship like that i was in a relationship like that but i have to be honest as funny as it was i think it it did eventually really hurt our sex life really i, I know that sounds just just ridiculous no i appreciate the honesty i think it was it was hilarious it was like the greatest farting relationship ever it was like we were like challenging each other but that doesn't, it doesn't end well in, in the bedroom, unfortunately, I, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay. But it's hilarious. Yeah, no, that's a good. So you trade hilarity for sex. No, that's very interesting. That's a true man's perspective on that. But to get back to, so that's one of the things. Another mm. one is, I think, don't be afraid to use porn. I just. Oh, I am full agreement with you full on that. Full agreement on the porn. Uh, and if your partner has some issue with you watching porn then that's a whole other issue. No, that's, there's a lot of, a lot to unpack on that one. But yes, I agree with you. Another one is, and I, I learned this reading the book Mating in Captivity, which I highly recommend to anyone listening. Uh, just the sense of maintaining a chasm, not, it doesn't have to be a great chasm, but a, a space between you that you yearn to fill. Mm -hmm. And that means just not doing everything together all day, every day. Especially pooping. <laughs> Especially pooping. And I, that's why Andy jokes that my being an opera singer is great for a relationship. Because oh, yeah. as much as we miss each other when I'm away, that bit of space makes us really yeah. want to come together. I've said, I, I've said it many times. If every man or woman in this country was married to an opera singer, there'd be no divorce. I don't know about that. But yeah, just little things. I feel like we've joked before on the podcast that we don't necessarily talk to each other all day. And it's not an intentional choice. But I th I really do think that having our own life, and this is tough in quarantine times, but having our own day separate. We I think yesterday we hardly said a word to each other. And it wasn't like, I'm not going to talk to you now. It was just we were both doing our own work day. Mm hmm and we watched the news while we ate lunch for like 20 minutes together, but we hardly said anything to each other. It was not an angry silence. No. It was just a functional, independent silence. Silence is golden. It often is. And I really think that it has been one of, this might sound weird, but one of my greatest strengths in my relationships because I've never dated a guy that didn't like that about me. You are as good a silent person as I've ever met. You, you, you are comfortable with silence more than anyone, any woman I've ever dated. Really? Yeah, You've you, never told me that before. You really, well, it's great. I mean, oh, so am I. Yeah. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying the woman, you know, shouldn't say anything. It's yeah. Not, it's not a sexist thing. It's no. like, I enjoy a silence and I know you enjoy a silence and I enjoy that we both enjoy silence <laughs> together. Yeah. And enjoying of the silence might have nothing to do with us even being... Enjoying it together, if that makes sense. Absolutely. We're enjoying silence on our own in the same room. Yes. It's beautiful. Yeah. We, but I've dated guys where there was just too much, like I felt it felt cloying. Like yeah. the guy wanted to cuddle too much, talk too much, connect yeah. too much. And I, there are moments, you know me, there are moments where I'm like, I really need to connect today. I'm feeling mm -hmm. the desire mm -hmm. to connect. Mm -hmm. And because I don't do it every day, you're more, you're happy for it. Sure. But I think that when it happens too frequently, then you're just kind of like, you just have had enough of the person. Well, it's just, it's just like, it creates stress. You're always like, you feel like you're always you know, have to be on guard, constantly getting bombarded by, by jabber, jibber. <laughs> so in conclusion, what are our main tips for keeping a spark alive when you are living together, long term, um, especially? Keep the mystery alive as best you can. And I say that especially, or we say that especially, because there will be times where it happens anyway, that you cannot control it. Something happens. Yeah, and save those those times for some good laughs. Yes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. There will be people who definitely disagree with us, but... I know, and I've, I know that there's people on both sides, ends of the spectrum. Yes. But I believe that most people fall somewhere 
in the middle towards not being super cool about their girlfriend or boyfriend dropping bombs left and right. And the next one that I keep coming back to, even though you don't seem to be focusing on, is the porn one. Mm, No, I'm down. Just because I think that it can allow you to fantasize about other scenarios together or separately. Because uh, let's be honest, as you become more familiar with each other, you're going to lose that that initial passion. That's yeah. just life. Oh, I 100% agree. I, the only reason I'm not vociferously jumping on this, this bandwagon, porn bag, bandwagon, the porn wagon, <laughs> is because I think a lot of people aren't comfortable with that. And I, 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 you know, I wish it wasn't that way, but I think that's the way it is. In that case, then I say do it for yourself. And then finally, if you can, keep some space in yeah. the form of silence, in the form of having your own activities, your own social life, yeah, be a separate being. Yes, you don't. You don't. It's good to be merged as one at times, but it also as you face the world together. Yes, definitely. But there also has to be times when you remind each other that you are actually separate beings. Yes, create a space that you yearn to fill. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true though. It's absolutely 100% true. true. Yes, familiarity breeds contempt. Distance makes the fa- the fond grow harder. Distance <laughs> makes the heart grow fonder. Those are Famous sayings old for is, a reason. Old as the, the mountains, but 100% true. Old as the mountains? Is that an expression? Yeah. I think the expression might be old as the hills. But okay. the mountains are older, older than the hills because hills are just... A hill could form in like a couple hundred years. Okay. mountain takes millions. So you doubled down on that saying? Yeah. I, I elevated it. Okay. Let's move on. Dear Shady. <laughs> Does it say Dear Shady? Yes. <laughs> So the main question is, how soon should you know that your partner is the one? Do you feel ready to take this one on? Um, It's always hard to answer these questions that ask for quantification of of love. Yes. Let me read read it and and then we can assess whether or not we feel we can answer it. Because I agree. It's so much easier to be like, this is the scenario I'm in. What should I do? Versus how do you know when blah, blah, blah. Right. Some background. My boyfriend and I have been together for five years now. Unfortunately, due to the usual societal pressures, pressures and expectations, I've been asked numerous times over the five years by friends and family whether he was slash is the real deal. We're five years in and dot, dot, dot. I have no idea. I'm very much in love with him and have been for our entire relationship, but I can't honestly say right now whether I see him as my husband or father of my children. She's 26. What? She's young. Yes. When I was 26, I didn't even know if I ever wanted to get married. I think I could answer this question before hearing the end of it. Really? Yeah. Do you want to try and then? I think that it's not that he's not the one. It's that she's not ready for the one. I agree with that completely and i say that because at 26 i could have met you and we could have had the connection we have and i wouldn't have known Mm -hmm. timing really is everything and you have to grow into your own desires for what you want out of a relationship yes Yes. she's not ready for the one and he may be ostensibly the one but he's not the one that she's gonna have when she's ready for the one wait how do you know that they could he could still be the one she in three years she could realize that's, that that's what, what I meant had. by yeah that's what I meant <laughs> I didn't articulate it well yeah so they could still be together in say three years when she's twenty nine and realizes that she's really sure that this is what she wants or maybe it's like it's like maybe he's screwed because he got in too early and when she does hit the age where she knows who the one's going to be he's kind of old hat and she wants a new one but the point is 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 valid is that i just don't think she's ready let me finish the question just because this is a very common theme in the questions we're getting Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that love the partner they're with but they that's why i always talk about in these love fest episodes about when did you know how did you know this was it Uh, she says i can't honestly say right now whether i see him as the father of my children or my husband i figure that i'll know when i know Either that he is the one I want to commit to for the foreseeable future or that it's not meant to be. I don't know if it's ever that clear. Yeah. I think it's clear when it is the one. I don't know if it's always clear when it's not. Yeah. I would say if you're asking yourself if it's the one five years in, it's probably not the one. I mean, she met him at 21 years old. Too young. It's very young. 
She says she figures she'll know when she knows, and there's no reason to rush to that conclusion right now. I agree. But but there's no reason to rush to that conclusion, but she's been doing this for five years. So I feel like there's a little caveat there. Yeah, but I also believe that you should that if there's no reason to break up, then why? I'm not saying they should break up, but if she's, again, by default, there's an issue, but she's writing into the, the podcast. Ah, yes. yes. So, so I have an advantage knowing that. But I think that she might want to consider a very amiable and exploratory brief separation. I think you're getting ahead of yourself. Let me, let me finish. <laughs> I tend to. However, many of those around me seem to believe that I should definitely know by now Andy would fall into that category. Uh, whether I want to make a future with him, since they all knew pretty quickly with their partners. I'd be curious to know if they're all their age, approximately. There are many aspects to our relationship that definitely contribute to this uncertainty. But I think perhaps a large part could do with the fact that I know I wouldn't want to make a life with him now. The place he is currently at his life, his career, his motivation, maturity, responsibility. Oof. However, there's plenty of love and connection between us and our morals, values, and foundational aspects of the relationship very much align. I think my hope is that the surface level things can and will change, and then I'll be able to fully jump in. Does that make sense? But of course, I'm also familiar with the notion that you shouldn't stay with someone for their potential. Who's to say he will ever reach it if he hasn't made any big moves in five years? I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. It, to me, what I get from this is... She's so young. She's 26. She's been with him since she was 21. I, I feel like the, a big takeaway with this podcast is you have time. Until you don't. <laughs> and to always bring it back, I'm so glad we did that Margie episode so early on because it's so nice to refer back to how you cannot change your partner. It sounds like it is based a bit on his potential, his career, motivation, maturity, and responsibility. I mean, the career could change. Motivation, maybe. He's 30, though. He's old enough to be mature. Mm -hmm. The level of responsibility, I don't really think that that's something that changes so dramatically. This is one of those situations where we would need to know so much more to make a real assessment on whether this relationship is good or not. Yeah. There's very broad strokes we're getting here. Yeah. But if I want to sort of generalize this situation, I'm going to stand by what I said earlier. I think that five years in a relationship is definitely long enough to have made some kind of assessment about whether this person is the one or not, mm -hmm. or close enough to the one. And I think that the reason she's having doubts is not necessarily because he's not the one for her at some point in her life, but I think it's because she is not quite ready and she needs to explore the world a little bit more. That said, she's in a bit of a tough situation because if I give her advice to break up, that's that's just draconian. Mm -hmm. But if I give her advice to, you know, take some time off, that might cause, you know, f some friction and uh, possibly a fracture in the relationship. He's going to be like, what, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Everything's good. So she's in a very tough spot. And I think she has to ask herself, is she happy enough right now? And does she see long lasting potential in this to say, you know what, maybe he's not the one, but maybe he's just good enough for me to make this work. You know what this is a really good example of, this email, is how badly we need specificity. Yeah, I don't know. There may, like, like we've had callers where they suddenly in the middle of the call, they'll be like, oh, and by the way. Yes. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah. you should have told us that at the beginning. Yeah. Like I get her question and I've felt this way before, but it's very broad. It's very broad. It's, she's not sure if she wants to live with him now with this place in his life, his career, motivation, maturity, responsibility. We're filling in the blanks on what exactly that means. Sure. How mature is he? How immature is he? How irresponsible is he? It's, are they in ways for her to not want to see a life with him? Are they, are they deal breakers or is it mostly good? You know, it's, this is, I, I, I might want to actually include this in the episode just to give an example of, no, seriously. A bad question. Yeah. We're not psychics. This is literally, we're taking the place of a psychic because she's given us nothing. If she had given us one specific, like, so there was this time when yes. I went to his family's house and he did this thing and we talked about it. Then we'd be like, okay, we got something to hang our coat on. 
Or a hat. You hang your hat on something? Well, well, you could hang your coat on something. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Okay. I hang my coat on it. And, you know, then we can make an assessment. But the only thing that I know is their ages. Ma- mainly. And they've been together for five years. And that it's just I, I know other. some math. And yeah. based on that math, I would say that if she came to us with this question and you added five years to their ages, I would say you got to you got to shit or get off the pot. And if you do shit, make sure you do it with the door closed and lights and matches. <laughs> Or not, if you really want to get off the pot. But my point is, is that she needs to make a decision if it's five years in the future. If she started dating this guy at 21, mm-hmm. which is very young. Yes. And she's now only 26. Yeah. And she's having this wondering about if she's the one, she's running into a podcast. I would say that maybe it's time to do some soul searching and and, and make a decision. But as you said, I have no basis to make that call other than just mathematical statistics she's given me yeah. which isn't enough yeah this is really is a good example of when we talk about spe- wanting specificity and wanting callers to come on specifically so that we can get that specificity uh how soon should you know that your partner is the one i feel like what people want when they ask this question and this is such a common question and that's why i'm harping on this is there is no answer to that question there's, there's no, no there's no one size fits all we, we're not psychics we cannot tell you how long is the there's and if we were to give you a number of months or years based on our own experience it wouldn't even apply because when we met we were a, at a completely different place in our life and right. we're completely different people yeah if i had a gun to my head if they really want an answer i would say within the first week if i had a gun to my head that's my answer if you want the answer <laughs> you like that <laughs> You missed it. You're four, you're four years and 51 weeks late. If I'm going to try to relate this to my own experience, because I remember my first major boyfriend, I thought I was going to marry at first. And then the more I got to know him based on things like where he was in his career, his motivation, his maturity, response, his responsibility. Now that I'm older, I look back and I'm like, thank God right. I did not marry him because those things never changed. Mm hmm. But am I saying they never change for everyone? You should never bank on change. No. It's a very big gamble. Especially when we're talking about personality traits. You can change jobs and maybe changing job will change your work ethic because you're more inspired to work for that job. Yeah. But again, it's too broad. It's too broad for us to answer. It's too broad. All right. But if you don't know in the first week, it's not the one (laughs) (laughs) to answer your question. Uh, I think we've answered this to the best of our ability with the uh, information we have, Mm -hmm. which, as you called it, are just stats. Stats. So uh, this next question is from Anonymous. Dear Shandy, oh, how I wish you were both around 10 years ago when I needed you. Oh, that's sad and sweet. I am 39. What? It's flattering. It is. This, This email like got to me. I am 39 years old and have been married for six years. My husband is 43. So far, most of your callers have been people who are on the dating scene. I listen to you give advice about what relationships should be like or not like and think to myself, I wish someone told me this before I got married. Similarly, I listen to your love fests and think, wow, I never knew some couples actually feel this way about each other. Hmm. I'm sure you can already guess I am not happy in my marriage. Quite frankly, I probably should never have kept the relationship going for more than a year, but alas, I was not nearly as self-aware or confident in my late 20s and early 30s as I wish I was. I was 29 when I met my husband and recently out of a five-year relationship that left me emotionally devastated. Yup, 29. Prime time for an I'm about to be 30 and I'm single existential crisis. Melodramatic? Yes. Yes. Now at nearly 40, I roll my eyes just thinking about this. Though I should have taken the time after the breakup to reset, heal, and figure out my non-negotiables, I did the opposite and jumped into a new relationship within a few months of my breakup in part to ease the heartache. My now husband was everything that my ex wasn't at the time and was a complete breath of fresh air. On paper, he was perfect and checked off many of the boxes I thought and still think in some instances were important. 
Technically, we should work because in many ways we are very similar. We had shared interests, hobbies, and aspirations and seemed to want similar things in life. But in reality, we could not be more different in our love languages, how we communicate, and what we need and want out of our partners. For example, I am effusive in my emotions and want a partner who supports me through life's greatest hurdles. My husband, on the other hand, is like a vault when it comes to his emotions. I've never seen him cry in the decade we've kn I've known him. He's been lacking in his support of me through many big life events, the death of a parent, an assault, a health scare. Some of these dif differences became apparent within the first year of dating, others over time. But instead of cutting my losses, I dug my heels in. It's so embarrassing to even admit some of these things because even when I hear myself describe them, I think, how did you think this would turn out well? Despite the red flags, we eventually got married. And here I am now, all these years later, the poster child for all your callers of what not to do. Mm. I feel unfulfilled in just about every realm of our relationship, emotionally, mentally, physically. I realize you give most of your advice to non-married people so that they don't end up like me, and a lot of your advice is based on your own dating experience. I also realize neither of you have been in an unhappy marriage or divorced, but I'm curious what you would say to me, someone who obviously didn't heed your advice when it was needed and is now in this position. Some pertinent points. Are you ready for me to keep going? It's a difficult one. I was about to say that she's very, it was brave of her. She's not brave because no one knows who she is. But I'm saying it's brave for her to let this out and, yes. and, and put like, it out there. I the feel universe. like I'm reading a diary entry. Yeah. Of like one that spans 10 years, like a lot sums of, up 10 years. A hundred percent, which is brave because a lot of people in life, and I've done this, they know they've made poor decisions and they and remorse is one of the most deadly feelings yes. in life. So they know they've made poor life decisions that they're going to live with for the rest of their life, whether they're hugely damaging or, you know, something that's kind of annoying either way. And they create a fantasy that it's not there. Mm -hmm. Like they, they kind of, if themselves. they don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And they do everything they can to justify what they've done totally and deny and people will be like why did you do that like oh well i did that because of this right? yeah, 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 yeah yeah and they cover it up they bury it and it's gone it's in a vault but for her to to put this out in the universe is brave not because she's t telling us who she is where she lives and her social security number and we all know who she is it's because it's now out there she's let it out of the box mm -hmm. and she's willing to 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 let it exist in its problematic state rather than keep it vaulted up so i think there's hope for her Anyway. Yes. Based on that alone. Yeah. That's such a good point. Yeah. It's like admitting you have a problem. She's being she, the first she, step. She is. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes. Like I am an alcoholic. Some pertinent points, probably of utmost importance. We have a three year old child. Ah, so crap. I feel extra. <laughs> oh, crap. I was about to say like kid for the hills. I was like, oh. Child, I... We have a three-year-old child, so I feel extra compelled to make our marriage work. Yes, I know there are all sorts of arguments to be made about not raising a child in an unhappy household. I've been in therapy for the last two years to try to work through some of these issues. My husband attends the sessions with me periodically, though not much has changed. I mention this purely to acknowledge that I realize this is something that needs to be addressed on a larger scale. Three... I really don't want to get divorced. I know, I know. Who does? But I just really want to avoid that route. With that last point being said, I guess my question slash statement is, okay, it's clearly evident now that we should never have gotten married in the first place. Anyone can see that. But we did get married, and now we have an awesome kid. So since we're at this point, what can we do to make things better given our differences and hurts we've built up? You've never mentioned your views on divorce. This is to us again. While 39-year-old me laughs at 29-year-old me thinking she was old, I'm sure an argument can be made that if I'm 49 and unhappily married, I will be kicking myself for not getting out of it at 39. But surely, hopefully, there have been other options besides one, getting divorced, and or two, accepting a life full of unhappiness, right? What's behind door number three? I... Uh, so... Uh, the kid makes it a little more complicated, but I have a lot to say about that. Yeah. Do you want to start? I think I'm going to start. Go for it. My ideas are fresh. Yeah. Number one, it 
at 39, 29 seems like you're a kid, but at 49, 39 seems going to, is as she touched on, is going to seem like you were a kid. Yeah. So don't put yourself in the grave yet mm -hmm. by any stretch. Very important. Very. Number two, and I don't really have authority to speak on this, but I do believe strongly in this. I think that a child, especially at that young of an age, is extremely perceptive and sensitive to dynamics with the parents. Yes. And I think that even though divorce is, a, is just a devastating experience for a child, I, as, again, I did not, my parents did not get divorced. Neither so I mine. don't, I cannot speak on authority. Mm -hmm. I'm just, from my experience, it's, pretty devastating and it affects your life. However, living with parents who have a clearly not good relationship and a bad dynamic and emotional blockage, I think can be just as damaging, if not s super obvious mm -hmm. in your behavior. Like I think what you're gonna do is you're gonna pursue relationships where there is emotional disconnection. You're gonna pursue men or women that don't give you the love language you're seeking. Yes. So, so there's gonna be damage either way on this kid, but there is one, I think one magic bullet, and I, I hate to give this advice, I, I feel it. like I don't have the authority to do it, but I'm going to do it because this is what I think. You're young enough that you can have a full life. Yes. At 39. Like me, I like, I wish I was 39. Yeah. I, I'd be, I'd pay, I give all my money to be 39. Again. Yeah. Um, you can have a full life. If you talk to your kid and you explain to them as best and as warmly and as, and as, just really try to get on their level and tell them what's happening as best as you can and involve your husband and tell, obviously you discuss this with him first, you don't just drop him. Like we're going to have a family discussion and then just drop it on the kid. But I'm saying, discuss it with your husband. Say, look, I'm just not happy. This is not going to work. And again, this is, this is, I'm just saying what I feel. No, I want this you to. It's totally inappropriate, but I'm going to say this. Tell your husband it's not working out. I'm not getting what I need. And, and I don't want this to be a horrible situation for our child. So I, I want to try to, you know, work towards a separation. And I want to us to both explain this to our child and, and allow our child to experience this without the amount of trauma that can be the case in many instances. And can be the case without talking about it and staying together and having the child again as i said grow right. up in a household and she says this she says i know there's all sorts of arguments to be made about not raising a child in an unhappy household um do you have anything else no i mean i'm basically i'm not saying she should get nestle divorced but i am saying that there should be a there should be a, a trial separation i hate to see this it's not it's her life she has one life yeah I feel exactly the same way as you, if not more strongly, to be honest. You know, she talks about how when she was 29, her now husband ticked off all the boxes of, you know, what she thought was important and some of what she still thinks are. But then she talks about how they communicate differently, the love languages, what we need and want out of our partners. I think that really gets to the heart of what people do wrong when they're looking for their forever partner is that they go for this checklist of things that ultimately in terms of your life, your emotional life together do not matter. If I'm going to be honest, you did not tick off my superficial, I mean, not some of them you did, but you know, in terms of being on paper, I think too many people focus on the checklist. And we talked about this with Rachel Lindsay, how she wanted someone who was black and who had the same religion or, or, worshiped the same God the same way she did and how ultimately that doesn't matter. Yeah. And that that's the biggest issue here is that what was lacking then is a part of who her husband is. This isn't something that changes. You cannot make a mm -hmm. person more effusive, not nat that's never going to be natural. Mm -mm. You can tell him that you want him to be more effusive and he can try, but even then it's not going to feel authentic and you won't receive it the same way as you would if you hadn't had to ask for it in the first place. hundred percent. That's why this email both moves me 
I feel a deep sadness for her, but at the same time, it angers me because at the end of this email, she's like, I really don't want to get divorced. She's what, what she's saying at the end of that email is I want to get divorced. That's what she's actually saying. But I don't, I can't do it. I don't have the strength to do it. Um, in a perfect world, she wants to get divorced. There's no question about it. If she could snap her fingers and be divorced and have her kid not be super damaged and everything happy and all yeah, the money all the work settled, is done. she would do it in a second. She, you have to, I think, and again, I have no authority to speak on this, but I think that's the question you have to ask yourself in a divorce situation. If I could snap my fingers and be fully divorced and be a year past this, would I do it? And I think she would. Yeah. And I'm going to say this. She has basically, she, she had a five-year experiment and five years of kind of crap is the way I'm just going to broad stroke it. Let's just, let's, let's turn this into metrics. Okay. They, they had a five year experiment Yeah. where things were kind of good and not great. And you know, they were figuring it out. It was worth that shot. Mm -hmm. Then they had five years where I think she's been pretty unhappy, mm -hmm. which is a loss. So she's lost five years. Yes. Does she want to lose another 40 years? Think of it that way. Is she going to sacrifice 40 years of her life where she could have, she could find someone who literally makes her happier than she ever could have imagined being ever, or maybe Which, not. Which by the way, would be the best example to set for your child. Yes, yes. That's what, there's two, it's a double whammy here because it's not just about her happiness. The best example you can set for a child is happiness in your own life. Mm -hmm. It always makes me sad when you see parents who only live for their children. Yes. Because I, I think that's an enormous pressure to put on the children. Yes. And I think that, especially if they're unhappy in their personal life, they don't have that example to look up to. And, and it also shows courage on her part. Yes. She did her best. Yes. And then she showed courage. She, she broke out of something that was making her unhappy and found something that was making her happy, all the while being a good parent. And honestly, I know a lot of, a lot of my friends, actually most of my friends are of divorced parents. Oh, really? Yeah. And I know the ones who had parents that were terrible in the divorce and parents that did their best. And honestly, the friends of mine who had parents who divorced well, so to speak, are great. I yeah. mean, I, I love them. Yeah. There's a couple of cases where I'm like, he's, he's broken. He's a parent of he's a parent of divorce bad. And that happens. This is not what she needs to do. She can do this right. Yes. Especially her, her child is only three. He's three. It's honestly, it's never a good age. It's, it's, it's only a good age if you're, you're like 40. The kid's 40. You know, it's never a good age for your parents to get divorced. Yeah. But, and it's a never good time. It's never a good time to get divorced either. It's never a good time. Yeah. But if they do it, he's young enough to not fully understand exactly what's happening. And I think that if they're both really loving and warm and give him the time that he needs or her, I don't know what the gender their child is, I think he can make it through this. What he will never recover from is a, a, an entire first third of his life being with two people who don't like each other. That's a problem. And again, we're taking her word for it here. She doesn't really talk about her husband's perspective that much on things. You know, we're really hearing her side of the story. I'd be curious to know if he is as unhappy. I would imagine he is. Yeah. Just because if they're that different. He may just be willing to take it. He may just be like more resigned to it. Just doesn't care. I mean, he sounds very closed off emotionally. Yeah. She wants to know what's behind door number three. And that's she's asking for something that we cannot possibly provide. No. Door number three is a lifetime of, of work and struggle and probably dissatisfaction. I, I Well, that was that was door number two, accepting a life full of unhappiness. Door number one was divorce. Yeah. And door there number is no three door is very similar to door number two. It's just you're working harder and you're probably not going to get where you need to get. Yeah, you can't change a person's DNA. Yes. And that's the other thing is that you can do all the right things, go to therapy, work to fix something. And who knows? Maybe there turns out to be a door number three where you end up with some degree of happiness. Yeah. But that is there is no guarantee. I would wager that you have a higher likelihood of success getting divorced and going through a really rough year and being selfish and focusing on your happiness yeah. than 
continuing to do what you've been doing for what seems to be years. Yes. And just to give an example of someone who's been on the show, Dove. Yeah. And I'm very proud of him. I've never told him that. I, I've sort of told him that. It's a little inappropriate, I think. To but for say reference, that. we're talking about confessions, confessions of a divorce. Confessions of a divorce, say. say. Yeah. Dove, who, by the way, got divorced when he was 46. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And with a kid who was around three. Yeah. Um, well, actually a little younger, but doesn't matter. I was proud of him because, and he's always, he's always, I've always been envious of his ability to just make big life decisions. Like, man, I wish I could do that. Yeah. He's amazing at it. I was proud. He's like, you know what? I went to couples therapy. I did everything I could. And by the way, I'm not saying he did everything right. Like he obviously did wrong. He, he was bad in the relationship too. I'm mm -hmm. not saying he's an angel. Yeah. But I'm saying he made the decision. He's like, you know what? I gave this everything I could and I'm done. And by the way, that kid is happy as a pig in slop. He yeah. is thrilled. He has got his mother. His Dove is with him all the time. They're having fun. They're doing things together. It's great. The yeah. kid's going to turn out great. I promise you. Yeah. Better than Dove. Way better than Dove. Yeah. Which isn't that hard. No offense, Dove. <laughs> he's a mess. <laughs> no, he's, he's fantastic. But I just want her to know that there are cases. And that's just one. That's like my, one of my best yeah, friends. Yeah, it's just like one person we've had to, happened to have yeah, on the podcast. Yeah, happened to be on the podcast. That guy is doing great. It works. You can do it. It can be done. To me, the overriding message I get from this, wanting, wanting to know about door number three, is doing the same thing she did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. it's, she's taking the path of least resistance. Yeah. There comes a point where you need to create your own destiny. I feel like by even writing this email is like a step in that direction for her. And I don't get the impression that she sent in an email like this lightly. But uh, just a, a reminder that you only have one life. I, I, you only have I, one. You can't, you, you have to really think about that hard. And, and I hate to say this, but divorce is one of the most expensive, depending on which side of the, the pond you're on, it, divorce is one of the most expensive things you can buy in life. And there's a reason why it's so expensive because you're getting so much. an enormous value. Yes. And think of the length of road that you've traveled yeah. in this experience and the long, long winding road ahead of you that you could either travel with the unhappiness or with the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Very important. And at least the pursuit of happiness has hope. Mm -hmm. Hope is a very powerful thing. Yes. What I get from this email is hopelessness, a sense of just getting by, yep. of making do. And 39 is not 39. It's, it's 39 is, is the new 29. It really so is. So she's basically the same age. Yeah. And also, I hate to, to say this, to, to sort of make it so base, yeah. but she already had a child. So she doesn't have to worry about, oh, my biological clock is ticking. I got to so find true. a guy. She had a, a, I'm sure this kid is great. She says it in the email. Awesome. That she it, says she, awesome great. kid. Yeah. I, say, I keep telling him he. I, I hope, don't know. I hope it's a boy. <laughs> Either way, it applies to a girl too. But she doesn't have to worry about that. She can go find some soulmate who has kids too or doesn't want kids. And she has nothing, no, no regrets. Oh, I never had children. Yeah. That's done. She's good. She's 39. She's not even 40 yet. Yeah. I was a baby at 39. Yeah. One last thing I want to say, and this, this is sort of tangent to this, but she did mention that this was a rebound. And I want to emphasize the, the caution. Yeah, this is such a cautionary tale about rebounds. I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. We could do a whole episode on this. Yeah. Rebound is so dangerous. Rebound should be for sex and building your confidence, yeah. period. Yeah. It's like buying a gun. You know, it's, I've used this analogy before. There should be a holding period. Yeah, I don't think anyone necessarily should have, but whatever, that's not. Yeah, we, it's like, <laughs> we but, don't condone buying guns. Yeah, but I don't, yeah. <laughs> don't have a gun. I mean, unless you, you, you do a lot of hunting and skinning and eating of your own meat. And that's another. That's another story. <laughs> but uh, there should be a holding period on breakups. When you break up, you are not in the right state of mind to do no. anything lifelong. It's like going grocery shopping when you're really hungry. 
Yes, or super and, high. And on your period. <laughs> yeah, and on your period. <laughs> yeah. High on your period and really hungry. <laughs> Don't go grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous. There's going to be a lot of Fruit Loops in the house. <laughs> But it's really important to sit and just breathe and take your time, have sex, yeah. build your confidence back up, but wait, do not go right from a breakup into somebody that you end up getting married to. I mean, it happens. I'm not saying it never happens that it, it works out well, but just beware. Yeah. And I don't want to focus too much on that because she did say... You know, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to rub it in. Yeah, this is not about rubbing it in, but as it, if we are to take one specific cautionary tale from this email, which I don't intend, by the way, to make this email a cautionary tale because no. I think that she has a beautiful child out of it. She's learned tons of lessons. Yeah. You know, she's realized what she needs versus what she thought she wanted. Yes. That's the biggest and most valuable lesson to to get out I of agree. 10 years of your life, truly. Yeah, it's only a cautionary tale if in 20 years we're in the same spot. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, that is the takeaway here. Thank you. I love you. That was oh, such a good answer. So sweet, my wife. No, but it's God. true. Anonymous, this is not the answer you wanted. You wanted what's behind door number three. We're, we're telling you to go with door number one. I think that's pretty clear, which is, you know, at least at the very least, take a break and reassess. And I just want to add one little thing here before you end. It's OK to be a little selfish in these situations. I, in fact, think you, you have to be extra selfish in these yeah. situations because there is so much working against her. Yeah. And there's going to be countless people in her life saying, oh, but what about your mm, child? Don't listen to Did them. You, have you tried hard enough? You know, two years of therapy isn't that long or whatever. They're not in her shoes. They're not in her shoes. No one else is in your shoes. Yeah. They have no right to to tell her to not be happy. No right. No one has the right to tell her that. Yes. I, I feel a little bad about... It's one thing to advise someone to break up with a guy they've been I dating know. for three months. It's another thing to tell someone to get divorced with a child. But life is long. Both long and short and... No matter how you look at it, you only have one. And I, I really believe, and I, you know me, I'm not an airy-fairy person about yeah. the stuff. I don't believe in the fate and all that stuff. But there is a sense of creating your own destiny, of not doing the same thing over and over again and hoping that it just suddenly changes for you. Yeah, yes. And it's not going to change. No. It may get worse, actually. And you know what's going to happen? And I hate to say this, it might already be happening. Maybe she didn't mention this, or maybe he hasn't mentioned this. But I think either there have been extramarital relationships or there are going to be serious extramarital relationships. And then how do you think that kid's going to feel? Very good point. Hmm. Anonymous, I we cannot thank you enough for this email. It really did feel so personal and like reading yeah. a diary entry. A, a, a diary entry that sums up 10 years. And I confess, I totally got misty eyed the first time I read it. And I knew that we had to have it on. But hopefully listening to us talk can make you see how the even sending this email is an action, but none your uh, refusal to make change is is still showing the same behaviors as you showed 10 years ago. And now you look back on that time and, you, and, you, and you're rolling your eyes, you say, and you're kicking yourself. Don't be 49 and, and experiencing that all over again. I 100% agree, man. I just, man. I hope. Yeah, I don't use the word man lightly. No. But I, I think that um, she still has time. Not a whole lot of time. Yeah, she both has time and also not all the time in the world. Yeah. It's, a, it's both. So do something. Yeah, give, your, do, give, be, your, give yourself a nice 40th birthday present. Just, <laughs> just give yourself. Give yourself a life. A life. Give yourself a life. Don't live only for your child. Yeah. I really believe in that. And, and, and as we said, it may be the best thing for her child in the end. And how much regret would you have if the child turned out to be totally emotionally defective because they stayed together? Yes. And she was unhappy. The remorse would be unbearably heavy. Yes. There isn't really a door three, but if you wanted to make a door three, just for argument's sake, your broaching of the subject might completely rejigger his entire mental structure. 
That's unlikely, true. very unlikely. But if you did suddenly out of kind of nowhere say, this isn't working for me, this is going to end, you're going to lose me. Yeah. He might have a rebirth. I'm not saying it'll last for a lifetime. Or it'll happen at all. Just or it'll happen the fact at all. That most she's likely. never seen him cry. Yeah. Most likely he's going to be like cold and be like, oh, okay, fine. That's the, that's the, that's the impression I get. She's going to be like, the impression I get oh, too. I'm sorry you feel that way. The, the point is, is that you, it's, a, it's another kind of win-win where start working your way towards the separation. And in that process, you might suddenly have a new husband. Yes. You never Who know. Who knows? But the worst thing you can do is just be passive yeah. and continue on and expect things to be different. Give him the kick in the ass. If it works, it works. If not, move on. And oh, that's, a, that's a heavy, heavy piece of advice. I feel I feel a little bit uncomfortable with it, but it's very, I mean, very clear to us. And the best thing we can do with this podcast is just be honest whether or not it's a heavy piece of advice. Yeah. Anonymous, good luck. Yeah, good luck and follow your heart follow your heart it's true yeah all right this question is from b b like b e e or b a just or b. just the word the, letter the, b. the initial b and you'll see why it's anonymous in a second oh good <laughs> dear shandy i am in a very happy relationship my partner Not done <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> My partner and I started living together during the pandemic and we grow closer every day. I have a big secret that I have never shared with anyone, not even my closest friend or anyone in my family, aside from my therapist. <laughs> you excited? Yeah. It's a big part of my life and I am wondering if I should slash can share it with my partner. The secret is that I was in a relationship with a married man for 10 years. I actually broke up with him because I met my partner. Had I not met my partner, I could very well still be with that married man. We will call him Mr. A. It was a good relationship. Mr. A and I loved each other very much. He was the first man that I truly loved. I grew so much from that relationship and I learned how to love. However, Mr. A was not willing to leave his family for me and this caused a lot of pain for me. He was looking for the right time. I believe him on this. He loved me very much and breaking up with me caused him tremendous pain as well. Uh, he was looking for the right time to divorce his wife, but something always came up either with his wife or his kids. I'm telling you this because I hold on to the relationship with Mr. A with good memories. The only reason we stayed together for so long was because it was a good relationship. I am not ashamed of it, but I do understand that people will probably judge me for it, hence it being a secret for so long. Currently, I have no contact with Mr. A, and I also do not have lingering feelings. I will care for him for the rest of my life, probably, but I do not have any desire to get back together. I'm going back and forth about whether or not I should tell my current partner about Mr. A. My partner is very open and non-judgmental. He is also not a jealous person, which makes me think that he will understand. But I do not know for sure. I will be devastated if our relationship is affected negatively by me telling him this. On the other hand, I really want him to know me. It's a huge secret that I've kept for so long. My therapist is actually amazed by it. And it would feel good to be able to tell someone, especially someone I want to spend my future with. Let me know what you think. Ooh, that's a tough one. Is it? I, 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 th I feel quite strongly about this one. I'm always amazed. I, I, I lean towards what I know you're going to say. <laughs> I'm, um, so, I'm so predictable. Uh, yeah, you're predictable. But in a good way. Um, but I only know that because I know you well, and you're, you're almost always right. But uh, I am always amazed how these married men slash women can carry on a meaningful emotional relationship for that long. For 10 years. How do you do that? I want to know. I want to know. I want to know how to do it, not because I plan on it, but because I'm fascinated by the 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 craftsmanship like the art of it. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, it also makes me feel even more strongly that uh, the husband in the last question, that there might be something going on there for him to be so emotionally detached. I agree. I mean, I don't want to make assumptions, but I agree a hundred percent, but God, I mean, does it kind of make you a bit of a psychopath? Was you have to be lying all the time for every fucking day of every week of every year of your 
fucking marriage. It's, How is that possible? It sounds exhausting. Exhausting. You have to be watch out for your phone. You have to make up lies about where you were. You have to make up lies to them about your wife. You have to. Oh my god, it's so. <laughs> it sounds hor. It sounds horrifying. You're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Here. Oh, sorry. That's true. Let's move on. To but no, time. but it's funny because it's true. I. It's easy to be like, oh, yeah, okay, he was married 10 years. Well, like, you know, that's the wrong thing to do, but whatever. But actually just looking at it from, if we are to look at the math of it, as you love to do, or just the statistics, it's how difficult. Like, it's almost impressive that you can maintain a lie of that level. That's incredible. Assuming his wife doesn't know. We don't know. Or maybe she's doing the same thing. And it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a, this symbiotic balance yeah. I mean, I don't even understand. I've been in situations like in my past where I was sleeping with two girls at the same time who were both like super casual yeah. relationships, like and even barely even relationship casual. And even that was like exhausting. Yeah. And we both can, we've both, we've admitted on this podcast before that we've both been cheaties and cheaters right. and having been a cheater that shit is tiring. It's tiring, yeah, <laughs> it's right. It's really tiring. It's really exhausting being a bad person. <laughs> it is. It's the. It, it's always the case. The truth will set you free. The truth is so easy. And yeah. in this case, okay, is this where I step this, in? This is where I would lean towards the truth, and which is what which I know I is going, what you're going to say. Yeah. B. You need to tell your partner this. You you seem to feel quite certain about your partner, uh, and that this is a healthy mutually understanding non-judgmental place and even if it's not his reaction is not what you want it to be that is a valuable information unto itself i don't think the partner is going to judge her for it if actually he's, it, it, the fact that she told us that he's very you know open and accepting yeah, yeah. And stuff, he's he's gonna be probably okay 95 percent chance but even if she let's say she doesn't tell him and this has happened to me before where I've been like, oh, do I need to tell her about this thing? And then you, know, it'll sometimes she'll either be drunk or they'll be having some kind of conversation where it'll somehow she'll be accidentally drop it. In yeah, a way. you want to be, be like, what you want to be? Well, I don't know. She's kept it a secret from everyone. Except she is therapy. good. Yeah. I have to admit. She, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's good at what she does. Yeah. But I really think that this is a test a test to see if this relationship is what you think it is. And if you feel that it's such a big part of you that you say you want your partner to know you and it taught you so much, it taught you how to love. We've mentioned early on in this podcast, someone asked how much you should talk about your exes and your current relationship. I don't understand relationships where exes are this like no go topic where you just pretend that you never dated anyone else. It's ever. very unhealthy. There's jealousy in the relationship. I think or so. Fear. Yeah, there's something. But to me, knowing the person means knowing what they've been through, the good and the bad, whether or not you're proud of it, whether or not it was the right or wrong thing to do, and how your partner handles that information. If they see you differently for it, then that, you would rather know that sooner than later. I, uh, that's, I know this is a really yeah. black and white way of looking at this. But for you to say this is a part of who you are, as a person who is uh, a result of your experiences, you need to tell him. I'm yeah. sorry, you do. You go. No, I agree with you. And I think also you have to think of it this way. If this person really loves you and cares about you and is mildly intelligent, they're going to realize that what you're telling them is a no win for you. You're basically offering them something that can only hurt them. There's no, no upside to it for them. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, what is she going to win by telling him from her perspective, by telling him the only thing she's going to win if he really loves her is deeper trust and love. Yes. So you can look at it as a no win or you can look at it as a win-win if you're with the right person. And if she tells him and it does negatively affect their relationship in some way as she fears, then this relationship is not what you thought it was. Thus the win-win. Yes. You can't have a bad outcome. You're right. I, the fact that I even sort of was near the fence on this, I, I take that back. <laughs> Did I convince you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we convinced me. It's, it's. <laughs> You're not giving me too much credit. No, no we, I'm giving you credit. You, yeah. you often do this, but I'm just saying that now that I've, now that I've just sat with it for a bit, I realized that she has to do it. 
I remember the first time we admitted to each other that we had she- cheated in past relationships. It's always a scary thing. And I know obviously this is different. This is a 10 year affair with a married man. It's, it's pretty serious stuff. I mean, it, it shows uh, there's a level of deceit that goes along with that. But nonetheless, when we shared with each other that we had cheated in past relationships, that shows that we can lie to our partners. Yeah. Truly. That's true. It's you, not you, a flattering thing to share. It's true, but you you kind of exercise the beast by telling him the lie. You're 100%. basically saying, I'm not that person anymore. Well, and that's the irony, is that when I think about the relationships in which I was my most cheaty, <laughs> mm. I was... Cheatish? The, I, yeah, I, <laughs> cheatish. The ones in which I was my most shady self, those were the ones that I felt the least comfortable being my true, honest, yeah. unflattering self in. Of course. And that's that's what's kind of beautiful is I remember when we f- first revealed this with each other that we are we have had moments of being bad people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It it was an exorcism in a way. Yeah. And I've never felt the need to keep anything from you and therefore to do something that could damage our relationship in a deep way because I can tell you everything. That's correct. You're 100% right. And if I did find out, let's say, I don't know, now or sometime in the future that you had a 10-year relationship with another man, I would it would make me feel uneasy. Also a little bit turned on, to be frank, <laughs> but, but mainly uneasy. Would you say that you would find it uneasy because I hadn't told you in the first seven years of our relationship? Also uneasy that you might be doing it right now, again. I don't well, know you. Well, I don't know who you are. That's B's fear, uh, yeah. presumably, is that her partner would then realize that she's capable. No, it's the it's you telling me it immediately is put to rest. If I found out without you telling me, <gasps> oh, then I'd be like, wait a minute. I don't really know this person. This person could easily be having another relationship. I see. I see the. You're point basically like saying to you're you're getting hired at a bank to be a teller, and you're like, I just want to let you know something. I've robbed banks in the past. Yeah, and the fact like, that you're admitting you're promoted. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that movie. But anyway, yeah. It's, Which movie? It's the movie um, Office Space, where he keeps telling them, like he's just like, yeah, I pretty much do nothing here. I just <laughs> sit around. Sometimes I surf the web. And he keeps getting promoted. I call my friends, and he's like, I like your style. <laughs> anyway, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. I think that might be the um, title of this one. I strongly believe that. The truth will always set you free, and it's easy. The truth is a hundred times easier than lies. It is. It's like smiling. You know, you use like, More I don't muscles know, 20 to frown. muscles to smile and like a hundred muscles to frown. Yeah. Well, we're really dropping a lot of really I know. new sayings I know, here. there's a <laughs> lot of cliches. completely never been said before. And cheesy lines today. But there's a reason why they're cliches. Yes. Because and, people keep saying them because they're true. And we're older. I feel like 15 years ago, I would have scoffed at a lot of these sayings. But now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, that's true. They're all true. They're all, all true. All of them. Yes. B, the truth will set you free. You will learn more about your partner by revealing this and he will learn more about you and it's a win-win because even if he doesn't take it the way you hope and predict that he will that in and of itself is also going to set you free well said it takes one to know one rome wasn't built in a day a rolling (laughs) stone gathers no moss anything else there's are there more oh i got a million more keep going Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. You want to keep going? Are we good? (laughs) Is that one really? Does that apply? It totally doesn't apply. But (laughs) I'm not that good that I can keep thinking of, of, you know, relevant Relevant. cliches. I can just think of. I mean, that one's probably also. They all. the, The fact is, almost every one of those sayings applies to almost everything. You can make a case for anything that's a problem applying to those things that i said i feel like b knew what we were going to say to this i'd like to meet a mr a that's right i'd like to meet mr a and i'd also like to see a day with mr a and mrs b or actually ms b no mrs a oh wait you want to see a day with i want to see a day with oh yeah mr a and mrs b wait no mr a she's b i want to see mr a and mrs a 
I have a good idea of what Mr. A and Mrs. A look like. Don't not, you think? It's not good. They kind of maybe look like a person from our last question. Oh, I was thinking the same thing. Maybe it is. Could you imagine? What would be the odds? We were just talking about winning the lottery. It's still better odds than winning the, the Powerball. Yeah, the current Powerball. Significantly better odds than winning the Powerball. As a matter of fact, way better odds than winning the Powerball. <laughs> and that should tell you you shouldn't play the lottery. Right there. Don't yeah. play the lottery. Yeah. Don't play the lottery. Andy doesn't. Yeah, he's not. It's a regressive tax. Not pro lottery. Not pro lottery. <laughs> I'm pro winning the lottery. <laughs> That was a deep Q&A session. I'm a little... It was a deep cut. I'm a little pooped. Speaking of poop. <laughs> Coming full <laughs> circle. Yeah. There's you can no beep, poop in this house, only You can flowers. be pooped, but you can't poop. <laughs> you guys, thank you for your amazing questions. Yeah, good. Detail, what except for the second one. <laughs> Keep them coming. Be specific. The more specific you can be, the better our answers will be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on that note, you can show your love for Dear Shandy by leaving iTunes reviews, leaving stars, all the stars. Leave us stars if it's five. Yeah. Yeah. Don't leave four. <laughs> Yeah, four is, is weird. But I feel like leaving any review on the web is like, it needs passion. Yeah. Like anything between, I three I kind of get, but like, really? No, I don't get it. I take that back. There's only two ratings you I, can leave, a five or a one. If you leave stars for Shandy, please let it be five. Oh, no, no. I'm not saying you should leave a one. I'm just saying in general, I find it weird when people don't leave a one or a five on anything. You know, the people who don't leave one or five, the people who leave like three are Yelpers. Totally. And you know what you know what the kind of people who leave a three or a two or a four? They're the same kind of people who leave a deuce in the toilet. Wait, leave it behind? Yeah. They forget to flush but they just don't even care. That's not true at all. I think they care too much. They care enough to leave a three star review. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they've never left a deuce in the toilet. Okay, I take that back. That's, that's getting cut. I shut you down so hard. You're so right. I am right. I don't even know why. Why would I think that? I don't know. I just thought they were bad people. <laughs> if you love Dear Shandy, you can show your support by liking, subscribing, leaving iTunes reviews, only, leave, only, and leaving only iTunes five. rankings of five stars, um, <laughs> uh, commenting, following us on Instagram, and all the things you would do to support a podcast that's recorded in a New York City living room. <laughs> no, it's a studio. Oh, yes. Studio 6A. Mm -hmm. And on that note, thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you next time on Dear Shandy. Bye. Dear Shandy.